so that really ends the group of, of speakers. So what we're going to do next is we're going to actually, we've got a number of videos, three videos from short clips from um, survivors um, who, is, who are going to talk about their experience. And I think what we'll probably do, rather than show you all of them right now, we'll show you one of them now, then we'll go to the panel discussion and, and start some um, um, answering some questions. And then we'll show a, a couple more videos as the evening progresses. So if that's okay, Nicola, if you could possibly show the first of the videos. My name's Nicole. I have BRCA1. Um, I was having surveillance from the age of 25. Um, when I was 30 years old, I had a test that came back. I went to my GP um, to get the results and they let me know that there was shadowing and that I'd have to have a biopsy. Even though I have the BRCA gene and, you know, I know the risks, I just, I was so shocked. I couldn't believe it. They had found six lumps in my left breast and I had a pretty big decision to make. The risk of getting breast cancer in my right breast would be 40%. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't want to take that risk and I had a double mastectomy followed by six months of chemotherapy. So I think just being as strict as you can be with surveillance, making sure that you attend every appointment that you possibly can, because if I had missed an appointment, you know, the breast cancer was growing so rapidly. I had um, triple negative breast cancer and it was really fast growing. And I was just so lucky that I went to the doctor when I did. My cousin, well, she has BRCA gene, BRCA1 and BRCA2. She was involved in Pinko and without her sharing her history, I wouldn't even know that I had the BRCA gene at all. I was so scared at first, like I was terrified. I didn't understand. I didn't know anything about it. And then she brought me into Pinko and I met other people that are going through what you're going through and they, they completely understand, they get you. They've supported me so much, even through the breast cancer. Yeah, it's just been such a valuable experience. It's been amazing. All right, thank you, Nicola. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on to the um, panel discussion as well as the four speakers that we've had, we've, we've heard from already, um, Sarah, Dr. Chung, Bianca and Dr. Fleming. We're now going to um, add two more experts to the panel. The first of those is, is Associate Professor uh, Zakir Hussain, who is a demographer and a health sociologist in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. She is a recipient of international awards, including AusAid and Winrock International. Associate Professor Zakir is a member of the Academic Board, Cancer Research Network, and New South Wales Police Multicultural Advisory Committee. Her research focuses on breast cancer awareness, quality of life of breast cancer survivors, reproductive health, migrant and refugee women, and women from resource limited countries. She has published widely in these areas. Professor Elder is a specialist breast surgeon at Westmead Breast Cancer Institute and clinical associate professor at the University of Sydney with a special interest in oncoplastic and reconstructive surgery. She is involved in numerous research projects and clinical trials within the Westmead Breast Cancer Research Collaborative. She graduated from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden in 1992, where she also completed her general surgery training and a PhD in tumor biology in 2002. She is president of the Australasian Society of Breast Disease and previous chair of the Oncoplastic Committee of Breast Surgeon in Australia and New Zealand and council member of Breast Surgeons International. She regularly participates in breast cancer education for medical professionals, students, as well as patient groups and the broader community. So we have all the panels. It's now an opportunity for the participants to ask whatever questions you would like. Um, please put them into the chat, or please, if you want to um, ask the question, uh, straight out that's fine as well but if you'd like to use the chat please do so um, we look forward to receiving some of those questions in the meantime um, we have some questions already that we're going to uh, present to the panel to start off the discussion maybe we'll do that for about 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll play another video 
um, another couple of videos, and then we'll have a final panel discussion after that. So if I can direct um, the um, first question to Dr. Jody Fleming, Sarah Powell and Bianca, um, how do you move forward after a breast cancer diagnosis? How do you overcome the fear of recurrence, especially as a mum with three young children? So if we can start with um, perhaps uh, you, Bianca, if you would like to kick off with that one. Yeah, look, I, I don't, from my opinion, I, um, you know, it's all still relatively new for myself. Um, you know, I think I just take each day, um, each um, new challenge um, as we go. Um, I don't hide anything from my family members, including my young son. So my son is currently six. Um, and as we said, he went off to school um, this year. So we haven't hid anything from him. Obviously, we haven't told him, you know, the, the worst case scenario. Um, but, you know, he, he knows that mummy got sick and he knows that mummy went to doctors who made her better and that, you know, mummy had to have some surgery. So I think having those open and honest discussion, um, discussions with both your partner and your children helps um, them, I guess, um, understand the changes that you might be facing. So, you know, because I was so open and honest um, with my child, uh, when his dad was off at work and I needed to, you know, lay down or mummy had a headache or was feeling slightly fatigued, he understood why. And so he was more compassionate about that and understood. And, you know, obviously children, um, you know, love us and, and want to do, you know, the best that they can for, for us as their parents as well. So, you know, that really helped him understand and allow him to be there for me, even though he was six. So, that was really beautiful um, and actually made us quite close. Um, there are a lot of networks and support systems out there as well, particularly for children. So it was actually a, a coincidence that uh, within the first month of my um, son actually going to school, there was actually a, a charity group who came out to his school and actually gave a presentation to all of the students around what it means to have cancer in general. Uh, and that was in preparation for a child who was going to be attending that school with cancer. But it really helped, um, you know, my son resonate with that as well. And he was able to share his experiences open, open, um, openingly with his friends, um, which I think was really beneficial for him too, because he could go off to school and it wasn't anything that he was scared to share or scared to talk about. And it normalised the situation, which I thought was really great. Um, for him. So yeah, that's a bit of background from me. Thank you, Bianca. Um, uh, Sarah? Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably, I'm, I'm a different perspective to Bianca because I'm 15 years down the track um, and I didn't have children when I was diagnosed, but I, you know, I do now. Um, I would say one thing, like be, be kind to yourself. Like I'm 15 years and I still worry about getting cancer. And, and that might seem crazy to some people. It certainly does to my friends. I think that they think once you get past that five year and the 10 year milestone, you're cured and that's it. You're never going to think about getting cancer again. But the reality is it would always be at the back of your mind. Well, it, it certainly is for me and a lot of the people I speak to. But I think it's finding that balance between it becoming overwhelming in your life and it being, you know, it's, it's normal to, to worry that you're going to get cancer, but allowing it to be a normal part of your life. Um, with my children, so I had children after I, I got cancer and, you know, I, I have a genetic mutation. So my daughter is the one that I worry about. You know, she, she's 14, my, my son's nine, so I don't talk to him as much about it. But my daughter's very aware that we have this genetic mutation in our family that at some point she will be eligible for tests. She doesn't have to, it's her choice. Um, and that it's not a death sentence. That's what I'm very clear with her about that, um, you know, there are actually some great options now, probably better options for her once she turns 18 than probably I had at the time. And that, you know, there's so much research going into this and that, you know, we'll hold her hand and that she'll have all the support she needs through it. So she's very similar to Bianca. I'm, I'm very open with my children about what I've been through. And I don't hide anything, um, but I talk to them in an age appropriate way about what's going on. Um, but yeah, look, I just, I would always say be kind to yourself because unfortunately that fear of recurrence, I guess would always, for some people, will always be there at the back of your mind, but you just have to make sure that it doesn't overwhelm you. And when it does, you need to seek professional help to, to help you get through that. 
can I have Sorry, a you're the expert on this <laughs> yeah, yes. oh, I don't know about expert um but I love I love I love what you just said um about being kind to yourself because my number one message always is you need to give yourself permission to be human first of all and as humans we're hardwired to survive we have very strong survival instinct and very strong death anxiety and having a cancer diagnosis is possibly the first and largest threat to that survival um, that your brain has experienced. And so um, it's going to be on super high alert for a little while until it feels as though it can calm its farm, I suppose, and, um, and ease off throwing you these postcards and reminders that, you know, you might have cancer again. It's interesting. Um, I just ran a, a group, a, a psycho-oncology group, and it had 10 participants. Five had advanced cancer and five had primary cancers and all were receiving treatment. And all of the advanced cancer patients had much significantly lower levels of distress and anxiety than the people with the primary cancers who are all still in that initial deer in the headlights phase um, where fear of recurrence is very at the front of their mind, not yet at the back. Um, and the people with the advanced cancer who are clearly facing what these other people fear the most um, had a very calming effect in actual fact. It was, it was a, quite a miraculous group. It was wonderful to watch. Um, but if I can just share a personal story, um, in 2012, so I was two years post-diagnosis, I went to New York to celebrate my 40th, it was a big milestone. My hair was back to normal length. It, it was something I really looked forward to through treatment. And as a psycho-oncologist, I had always wanted to go um, to and work, not that I ever have, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, one of the leading cancer hospitals in New York, um, in Manhattan. And I met up with their head social worker at the time. And she said, oh, while you're in town, we've got all of these survivorship things happening. There was this wonderful survivorship um, talk where Kathy Bates um, was the guest speaker. There was a, um, a couple of workshops that she invited me to. Um, and they had this massive survivorship program and at that point, even in my training, I hadn't been so aware of survivorship as a, such a significant stage. Anyway, of course, I chose that opportunity to um, ask her, you know, am I ever going to stop being scared about this coming back? And she said, oh, yes. Like she was so confident in her answer. And she said, you think about it. She said, one day you're going to go through... Um, half an hour and you won't have thought about cancer and then it's going to be an hour and then it's going to be half a day and then it's going to be a whole day and then it's going to be two days and then it's going to be a week and then it's going to be a month and then it's going to be a year you know um, and I can say from personal experience and from working with my clients that that has truly come to pass it's not at the front of my mind anymore and like Sarah said it is at the back of my mind but we need it to be because if something isn't right that means we'll go and get it checked and we all know that the earlier we we can pick these things up the better the outcomes will be so um, I think it's about being very kind to yourself and allowing yourself to be human. But also, um, I think in terms of the new normal, I think we underestimate how much change we go through in our entire lives. And um, we're always changing. Like the us at six is not the same as the us at 16 and 26 and 36 and 46 and 56. It's just that when you go through something like cancer, um, the thing that's making the change happen is just super intense and super fast. And so it feels like I've turned into this entirely different person. But in actual fact, our personality traits don't change really, no matter what happens to us. Um, there are our innate strengths and our values, our core values that don't change either. So I often say to my clients, and I did for myself as well, try and stay as much in the moment as you can and try and reconnect with those parts of yourself that you know are still you. And that helps um, get rid of that, that fear that I, I'm not myself anymore and that self-talk that can really be quite distressing. See, this is why you don't give me too long to talk. So <laughs> I hope that's okay. Thank you, thank you Jodie. You've actually done very well. You've answered another question that came through 
Oh. As, as you were talking, so well done. That's um, that's great. Um, so, uh, Zakia, a question uh, for you, I think. Is there any work um, being done to help culturally and linguistically diverse um, individuals understand the genetic components of breast cancer and the need for more vigilant screening? I think there's a research done in you, you, in a, you in a, in a st states. It's uh, the, the thing is about the e ethnic, racial, and cultural identity and perceived benefit and barriers related to genetic testing. So the, this study is talking about the benefits and barriers to uh, genetic testing. They use the example from uh, African descendant American, those who are living in there. So there, there are different ways of talking about the barriers and, and the you know, benefits of doing it. So this study, I can give you the reference if you want. So I will, I'll post that in here. Yeah. That, that would be terrific. And indeed, if anybody has any references or background material that would be useful for our participants today, please do forward them to us and we can, we can put those, make sure that everybody, everybody gets those. Um, a question now for um, um, Professor Elder and Sarah Powell, perhaps. Um, how has COVID impacted on identifying breast cancer recurrence? Um, well, firstly, thank you very much for having me here, and it's wonderful to hear these beautiful stories and, and encouragement of hope. Um, and I do appreciate, really, and I see that with my patients, how difficult it has been to go through this COVID period and to both having cancer or having had cancer. Um, and I think what you were saying before about the fear of recurrence is really very difficult for many people to cope with. And of course, having that and then having COVID on top of that doesn't make it easier. Um, and of course, we know that it's for real when, when you're going through treatment that your immune system will be weakened, particularly if you're having chemotherapy or radiotherapy and it'd be difficult therefore to be out and about um, in a COVID safe way. However, once you have completed that, then you're not really of any higher risk than, than other people, but I think the fear is still being there. Um, so having said all of that, I think um, as we see the same way as we've seen less people coming for screening, we've also seen less people keeping up with their follow-up appointments mm -hmm. um, in terms of surveillance imaging, um, and therefore there's a, there's a delay maybe in diagnosis of, of recurrence. But fortunately, I don't think it's actually, at least not in Australia, impacted on the, the overall survival through that, because fortunately, most patients' cancers are quite slow growing. So um, a few um, weeks or months delay may hopefully not translate into a worse um, prognosis or survival. Thank you, Professor Elder. Sarah? I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, not really. It, it, it's probably more of a medical question that, that, than relevant. Um, I don't know that COVID has impacted on the diagnosis of a secondary. I mean, you know, back to sort of the message that I think overall, in cancer diagnosis generally, we know that there is um, less cancer has been diagnosed through COVID than prior. And we know that um, cancer isn't waiting for COVID to be over, you know, it, it doesn't, you know. So there is definitely a lot of people out there with cancer that haven't been diagnosed. And unfortunately, they're going to be diagnosed at a later stage, which means they'll need more treatment and will have a coral prognosis generally. So, so our message is just clear, just go, go back, book that check, book that screening and, you know, get back to the doctor. Yeah, and, and I think that what you just said there, Sarah, leads perfectly on to Dr. Chung, if you like, and her, her wonderful study her, in, in Sydney. And um, I, th I thought it was very reassuring that when we saw that dip in April 2020 afterwards, um, the detection rate seemed to go up above to compensate for what had been missed um, in that earlier period. <clears throat> um, I thought what was particularly interesting was that it seemed to me, if I read your graph correctly, Dr. Chung, was in the 
that the, pe the, the individuals who recovered most rapidly seem to be the over 75 year olds, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm just wondering um, why that was the case, why they seem to sort of take the most advantage of, of getting back to normal as quickly as possible after, after the shutdown. Yeah, so the graph that we're, um, we, we broke down into the age groups, um, the, in actual fact, the, at the earlier stage um, when our service reopened, we found the, it was the breast screen target age group that recovered initially, mm -hmm. um, so the 50 to 74-year-olds. But you're right, by, we found that by um, the end of the year, particularly December, um, um, the over seventy-five year olds um, were had a. I think it was it was roughly about uh, three times the number um, in December two thousand twenty compared to two thousand eighteen, and um, um, we we put it down to potentially it was because there was a um, particular uh, focus on getting um, the people who were. Um, missed out on the appointment during the lockdown and also um, based on the priority groups that press, um, that Cancer Institute um, gave out, which is getting the target age group to come back. Um, and that probably attributed to the initial rise of that particular target age group. Um, but it, I, think, I think the graph overall, it's quite reassuring that eventually all the age group um, came back and then a particular uh, Big jump for the 75 year olds as in um, they are still looking after themselves they're still presenting to um, breast screen um, yeah despite um, despite you know what had had gone what had happened um, in during the months of lockdown or during months of closure last year yeah and in terms of the ones that seem to be most fragile in terms of coming back to attend after the shutdown it was the uh, first attenders, I think, which was a, a very interesting observation. Yeah, so essentially at, um, at the service, um, everybody could come back um, essentially, um, but the ones who were even more actively reminded um, would have been those who were um, you know, due to return highest um, higher risk um, people or um, annual screeners um, and effectively that's reflected on the uh, findings of the of the you know, when we divide it into the first time screeners versus the uh, re-screeners essentially um, yeah and, and again that's reflected on the first couple of months um, of the service reopening and eventually, um, which was really good that we saw the two groups all um, jump back up um, and towards the end of the year again, um, both groups um, were essentially um, coming back at a much higher monthly um, number compared to 2018. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Okay, I think Nicola, could we play a, uh, a couple more videos if that's possible? My name is Kathy Harrison and I have been on a journey with BRCA2 for about four years and have literally just had a double mastectomy with a deep flap surgery just two weeks ago. Having the BRCA2 diagnosis really pushed me into having my ovaries and tubes out and that was extremely traumatic as I felt that I didn't have a choice to explore what I needed to do. However, with the breast surgery, I knew 100% that was something I needed to do because my son was young and wanting to be around. Post the surgery, I sort of have fallen apart a little and the recovery has been tricky. But um, even only last Thursday when I got the results back from the mastectomy, but that there was actually cancer tissue. And so that kind of shocked me. The biggest lesson that I've learned about this experience is really trusting your own intuition. I chose to do the surgery as a risk reduction and that's been just so solidified with the results of knowing that there was breast um, tissue that had cancer. It feels dramatic, but I actually feel like I've saved my life.
So my name is Jessica and I was diagnosed with breast cancer at 26. It all happened like one Sunday night, um, just out of the blue. I just felt a huge lump on my breast. And so I asked my mum to feel it and she was concerned, she said, go to the doctor the next day. So I went to the GP the following day. I got a phone call from the doctor the next week telling me to come in. And so he pretty much told me that I had breast cancer. So then I had five months of chemotherapy and then I had surgery. During all that as well, I got genetic testing done and I found out that I was BRCA2, I had the BRCA2 gene. I decided to go with a double mastectomy um, with delayed and immediate reconstruction. I also had a precancerous tumour, so I'd need radiotherapy. So I did 25 sessions of radiation uh, five days a week or five weeks. Now I've done all that. I'm just waiting on my second surgery and that's it. Biggest lesson is how strong I am. Um, I also have a three-year-old son. So during that time, I was looking after a two-year-old and going through chemo and I was exhausted. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I just wanted to say that um, cancer, it doesn't really care about how healthy you are even how young you are and um, just to be vigilant and know your body. And if you feel like something's wrong or like feel something or something doesn't feel right, just go get it checked out no matter how small literal it is. That's Thank it. you very much Nicola for that. Um, moving on to um, some more questions. Um, one for Professor Elder. Um, should women who have had a risk reducing mastectomy with aesthetic flap closure still have screening MRIs stroke ultrasounds? So for people who have had prophylactic or risk reducing mastectomy, whether that is with the reconstruction or without the reconstruction, you have then re significantly reduced your risk of developing breast cancer, uh, which is why you're basically doing it. So you actually have a significantly lower risk than the general population of, uh, of developing breast cancer. So there isn't really any real evidence that you need to have um, regular screening or surveillance in that um, circumstance, but it's really important the clinical examination. So as we heard in these videos, if there's a slightly uh, unusual um, that you feel that it's something is not quite right, and you feel something, um, a, either a lump or an area that is not healing or is different, then that should be checked out in that circumstance. Okay, thank you. Um, what other questions do we have? Yep, yeah, um, um, Bianca. Um, you, your, your, again, your, your experience of, of having cancer was a, uh, with, with having a six-year-old must have been extraordinarily traumatic. And you talked about lots of wonderful support, but was there anything that was missing from the support? Was there anything that you needed and wasn't available to you? Um, good question. No, I don't think so. Um... And I think that's probably two reasons for that. One is because uh, I'm a very determined person. And um, as, um, you know, others have said, you know, sometimes that survivor mode kicks in. And for me, uh, that's very much how I um, processed uh, what I was going through. So for me, if I didn't think I had uh, support or the information I needed from one avenue, I would go and hunt out a different avenue or a different option. Yeah. Um, so I actually did surround myself in quite a number of different resources, um, probably a little bit overkill for what I needed, um, but that gave me that level of assurance and support that I needed because, you know, as I didn't need them or I had that reassurance given from those providers, I then was able to wean them off and, and then end up with, um, I guess, a much smaller um, consistent network that followed me through the, the whole process. But um, yeah, there wasn't anything that I didn't feel. Um, I think probably if you ever 
feel that you are unsupported, then, as I said, there's other avenues. So just reach out to those support networks and I'm happy to share uh, with, the partic- with the participants all of those links. Um, you can also look me up um, on social media as well. I've got quite a lot of links in my social media network. Um, yeah, but just if you if you feel that you're not getting what you need, then source it from somewhere else because essentially, you know, it is all about you. And I think we've uh, had other people mention it. You need to do the best for yourself at this time because if you don't look after yourself at this point, then, you know, like in anything else, how else are we supposed to be that wife or be that mother to that child? So, yes, people think that it may be selfish or you may feel like you're being selfish, but you're actually not. You're actually being the best version um, of yourself and being that best mother if you are focusing on you first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. And and sort of extending from that, a question has just come in. Um, what is the most important role of family and friends in the care of cancer patients? I don't know if anyone would like to have a go at that. I can um, just... Okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, sorry. You go <laughs> Look, um, I'm looking at from a, you know, a patient and a, you know, a, a community perspective, but one thing that we really um, advocate for at Pink Hope is um, we want people to be, you know, to, to be strong in and, and be educated to be able to advocate for their own health. But we do recognise that you can educate, you know, anyone and they can have all the information but when they're told they've got cancer, everything just goes out the window, right? So they, you know, they 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 they're the strongest person, or they're, you know, it's not even about being strong, but they can have all the information. But when you're sitting in front of a doctor and you, and that person says to you, "You've got cancer," it doesn't matter all the questions and everything that you think you're prepared for, it just goes out the window. So we really talk about a lot of pink hope about we need to educate carers as well, right? So it's the person that goes with you to those appointments, the person that supports you through that. And so I, I think, you know, your, your family and friends are the most important people through your cancer or for us high risk journey. So, yeah, I, you know, that's why at, at Pink Hope, we, we have a lot of resources that are not just for the person, but also for the carers, you know, so that they can feel supported. And we get a lot of calls and emails from carers that want to help their family, you know, or their friends or their, you know, the person that they're going to those appointments with because they want to do the best that they can for those people. And, and, and that's amazing. So incredibly important, those people. Would anyone like to add to that? Um, I will, if that's okay. I think Please. you'll find in most of the psychosocial research that Um, Our social support is our number one coping mechanism when it comes to uh, going through cancer. Um, And uh, I was just thinking about what Bianca was saying. I'll often draw, it's kind of like the onion, the layers of the onion, you know, a few circles and you pop yourself in the middle and your your closest social supports in the next layer of onion. And and as you go out, the the people get more and more um, distant from you. But the rule is that you're only allowed to ask for support from somebody in the layer outside of you. So what that means is the patient who's in the centre can ask for support from that whole onion, but the people can only the people who are providing the support can only get support from the people outside of those layers and and not the the patient themselves I mean we carers partners spouses have to pick up a lot of um, the roles that the patient isn't able to fill while they're going through active treatment in particular Um, and actually carers my thesis was on (laughs) comparing the psychological distress between um, patients and their partners and um, the patients actually, in my study at least, um, experienced as much, if not higher, levels of distress because of all of that. Um, so they do need to be looked after as well, um, but not by the patient <laughs> necessarily. Yeah. I think just one thing that I'd add to is very early on, I was advised a really good little tip, and that's just to record all of your findings. A lot of your um, health practitioners and your, your treatment teams will not have any issue with you recording your uh, appointments. And I found that really valuable because even if I did take a family member with myself, sometimes that person 
as you said, Jody, is emotional and has a lot of, um, you know, uh, feelings that are attached to that as well because they're close to you. So if you can record it, it's something you can always go back to, play back that information and, and go back and answer some of those questions that you might not have actually heard at the time. Yeah, look, I, I love that, Bianca. That's actually something I recommend to anyone that is going through. It doesn't, doesn't even need to be cancer, like any treatment. And particularly in COVID, where sometimes you might not be allowed to have someone to go into that appointment with you, just say to the person, the doctor, the specialist, can I record this? And none of them will ever say no. And it's so valuable because sometimes you'll space out or, you know, like you say, the person that comes with you might not just be able to take it all in and be able to listen to it later is really valuable. So great advice. Thanks, Bianca. Now, I, I have the problem that we have six minutes left and I have a, a plethora of questions in front of me, but we, we will try and answer all these questions and, and, and make them available to everyone here. There's a question on breast density and the relationship with screening and so on. Um, I, I suppose I could have a go at that. Um, breast density really has a, a, a double whammy, if you like, with, 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 with screening in that. Uh, firstly, if you have dense breasts, then it's harder to see the cancer because the cancer is white and the density of the breast is white, and therefore one clouds over the other. It's got better, and we've shown this in, in various research projects we've done here in that with digital, the, the situation um, uh, has the potential of, being, of improving because you're not just relying on, on film. You can actually post-process the image and try and enhance the contrast and try and find that cancer and, and so on. Um, so I think that's, that, that's promising, but still um, density does make it generally, not always, but generally makes it more difficult for the observer. Now it depends on the experience of the radiologist and the clinician and so on. But the other thing about density is as well is that it increases the, um, there's a relationship between increased density and increased risk as well. Um, so for a woman with a dense breast, there's even more of a need to be really observant and, and look closely at the image to try and find the cancer because there is an increased risk. And what we have found in practice is that clinicians, we can do this with eye tracking, we can watch how clinicians look at images and so on. And those, um, when, when an experienced clinician comes across someone with enhanced um, density, they, they work harder. Uh, they actually go into that image in more detail. They'll enhance it. They'll, they'll look at, they'll work much harder the image to try and find it. So that's a compensatory mechanism. But obviously that's from the more experienced radiologists and more junior radiologists have to learn um, and sort of adapt um, uh, more and more as they, get, as they become more experienced. Um, but, but the health density thing is very interesting because in Southeast Asia, for example, we have far lower incidence of the disease and yet we have far higher density. Um, I don't know, Jan, whether Jan, uh, Dr. Tre's work in, in Vietnam was actually looking at the variety of density between North and South Vietnam, which, was, which yielded some interesting results. I don't know whether, um, Jan, you'd like to comment on that. Uh, Patrick, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so actually uh, my PhD is about the breast cancer and also its relationship with breast density in Vietnam. And we found that the majority of Vietnamese women, around 75%, they have higher density comparing with Australian uh, mammograms. And then we also found that like the women have the higher dense breast are more likely to have breast cancer. But that's a problem in Vietnam because uh, if the mammogram was too dense, it's very difficult for the radiologist to detect cancer on it. Um, so uh, currently in Vietnam, they prefer to combine uh, ultrasound with the mammograms for the younger woman. And um, currently we're still looking for the way uh, to improve the breast cancer detection of mammograms. So that's why we run the VIGRAS project that's um, the project that Professor Patrick Brennan and I were doing. So we're trying to help the religious in Vietnam to improve the breast cancer detection on the high dense breast. Yep. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jan. Okay, I'm, I'm down to the last two minutes, but I have to squeeze in one more question, if, if I may. And that's to um, all of you. Now, we've heard a lot about optimism, resilience and grit, and Dr. Fleming um, uh, talked about you know, moving from, you know, one hour to two hour to half a day to, to a month 
and, and so on, where you don't think about recurrence and so on. How, for those people, for those survivors um, um, newly diagnosed with cancer, how do you think you can accelerate that moving from one hour of not thinking about recurrence to one year? You know, how can we promote, you know, if you like, optimism, resilience and grit? Can I, can I just start there? I, I don't know if you, you sort of can, and J Jody might correct me here, but I feel like it's a process and there's certainly things you can do to make sure you don't slow it down, perhaps. But I do feel like rushing it also probably isn't healthy either because unfortunately it is kind of a process you have to go through. But I'll, I'll be corrected by Jody if that's not the case. No, that's absolutely right. And I always think, even if we just want to think about in terms of grief and loss and all of the change that you go through when you um, go through cancer diagnosis and treatment and all the changes to your roles and to your financial situation and to your social situation and to your body and to your way of thinking and everything, um, we would never encourage anyone to rush through a grieving process because that only gets suppressed and tends to come out later on as something a lot uglier, um, a lot worse, a lot more significant. So yes, I agree totally with Sarah. It's definitely a process. Now, we think about um, often in terms of, I suppose, an a adjustment disorder a normal adjustment period to a life stressor is around three months and then if it takes somebody longer than three months to adjust to that thing we start to worry and you might refer them um, to see a psychologist or somebody like me um, but when you think about cancer cancer isn't a single event it's not like you had a car accident and it was done you know um, every day is like a car accident sometimes and <laughs> like you're getting you know, you're having these scans and you're getting scansiety and you may get bad results and you may get good results, but you're having these treatments and you've got all these appointments and it's kind of like a year of car accidents um, if you're lucky, just a year. So therefore we'd expect the adjustment period to be a lot longer as well. Um, and so maybe we're looking at that, you know, at least two year mark um, before you truly notice a significant reduction in, um, you know, those fears. And like I said in the beginning, um, you know, we want them there because they're what make us vigilant about our health and they make us um, proactive. However, if there's something, those thoughts, those fears of recurrence are impacting on your social functioning, if they're ca causing you significant distress, if they're impacting on your occupational or academic functioning, if, if your quality of life is just not what you want it to be, go and seek help. That's what cognitive therapies are for. And there are a lot of tools um, that you can acquire that may not stop those fears popping into your mind, but they can certainly skill you up to manage them when they do. Um, so I would, I mean, I'm a big advocate. I saw a psychologist all the way through my year of treatment and then I sacked them and saw a new one for the year after because I didn't want them to be all mixed up with my cancer stuff. So, you know, go and talk to somebody. Like we have tools. We don't have to suffer that much, I think, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. I think I'm going to close it there. I mean, um, because we have just run over time. So I just wanted to say thank you all very, very much for, for being here this evening. I'm very um, grateful to the speakers and, and the panel, uh, particularly um, um, Ms. Powell, Dr. Chung, Ms. Kamuya, Dr. Fleming, um, Professor Hussein and Professor Elder for their invaluable contributions. I think it's been, I think it's, it's wonderful to hear the true stories from people who have either experienced cancer or they have helped look after people with cancer or indeed sometimes both. Um, so we're, we're really, really grateful for all of that. We're also grateful for the, the, the three women who uh, spoke so bravely about their own journey through the videos. Um, and we're also very grateful to the organizers of this and particularly uh, Nicola um, and Jan who spent a lot of time getting all this together as well as Sarah and Lisa from, from Pink Hope. So we're grateful to everyone for making this evening so um, extremely powerful. 
Um, so we still have some questions left. We will answer those. We'll put them out as resources for everyone who attended. Um, and also the other thing we would welcome from people who are listening is what we should do next. What should our next consumer event be? Um, as I said, we usually run two or three of these a year. So we, we're really welcome any, any ideas at all. So thank you all for your time. It's been a really powerful and really uh, wonderful evening. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. And I'm sure the whole community is grateful to you all.